Hello and welcome to Control Alt Achieve Live for May 22nd, 2023. Thank you so much for joining, whether you're watching live or you're catching the recording later. I appreciate you learning with me. A little bit of housekeeping before we dive on into things tonight. As normal, all of the resources we'll be taking a look at can be found at bit.ly slash CAA dash live. That'll get you to a Google document. And if you scroll on down to the second page of that document, You'll find the links that we have for tonight. As normal, we've got uh, some links of EdTech resources I've come across from around the web, as well as some that I have shared on my blog recently. While you're taking a moment to pull all of that up, though, do a quick introduction. So howdy, everybody. My name is Eric Kurtz. I'm an EdTech coach up here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, I also run the website Control Alt Achieve, where I share out uh, all of my ed tech resources. There's lots of ways to connect with me. If you look at the top of the document, you'll see uh, email and YouTube and my weekly newsletter and uh, the Control Alt Chief email discussion group. Lots of options there. So whatever works best for you, I encourage you to connect. Um, also, uh, do note we do have some uh, other upcoming live streams at the end of May. Uh, we've got our GEG Ohio meeting, and uh, we do those typically once a month. And although that's not uh, the same as my Control Alt Chief live, uh, I do always want to mention that because uh, that is a, a great uh, resource to be able to wrap up everything new in Google from the last month. Month. Now, during the session tonight, I would love to hear from you guys. So if you do have a question or a comment, uh, please go ahead and throw that in the chat. Um, I'll do my best to keep an eye on that. Uh, you can also leave feedback right here in the document as well. All right. So again, welcome, everybody. Uh, if you have not had a chance to pull up the document yet, one more time, that is bit.ly slash CAA dash live. And we'll go ahead and let's scroll on down to that second page. And we're going to take a look at what we're going to be exploring here tonight. All right. Fantastic. Oh, see some folks saying hi in the chat. Hello to you, Peggy. So, so good to see you here tonight. All right. So it's been a few weeks. It's actually been about, I think this is uh, about three weeks since the last uh, uh, broadcast. Um, I've had a number of trainings here recently. And so uh, it's been a pretty busy May, as I'm sure it's been for a lot of folks. So I've got a couple extra resources tonight since it's been a few weeks, uh, but I will try to move quickly through these so uh, you still can uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> so let's go ahead and start off with uh, some neat things I've come across from around the web. So the first resource we're going to take a look at here tonight is called YouTube Transcript. So let's chat about that. So basically, this is a free and easy site uh, that you can use to get a transcript from any YouTube video. You basically just paste in the web address of the YouTube video and the video will show up on the left. And then on the right hand side, the transcript will show up and you can you know, click on the text and it will jump you to that part of the video. Um, or you can just do this to grab the text. Maybe you want to copy and paste that text elsewhere. Uh, and so that's what I've been using this for quite a bit recently. Um, been doing quite a bit um, of work with, with AI, you know, with ChatGPT and BARD. And so one of the things that um, I've thought of as a, as a, a, a nice use of AI is to uh, have AI give you summarizations or uh, bullet points or questions from a text and a transcript from a video is text. And so uh, that would work great. Well, sometimes the, the struggle is getting that transcript. And this is a really easy way to be able to do that. So let's try this out. Let's say I head on over to YouTube transcript. And then uh, for my video here, I'll, I'll go ahead and let's say we're going to um, look for a video from a Crash Course. I think they're always a good, uh, a good uh, option there. This is a, a video on glaciers, I think. Here, let's go ahead and put that in. Yes, I grew up in Ithaca, New York, in the video. U.S. I don't actually need to play it. Uh, but this is a video from Crash Course. Um, and this one's on glaciers. All right. Excellent. So let's say that I was going to be teaching this topic in class. And this is a video I was going to have the students watch. Well, what's nice is right away, boom, now I've got the full transcript from that video, which in and of itself, that's that's just nice to have. But let's say we come in and we 
select this now. We'll go ahead and we'll copy all this text. And so I could come in here and copy this text, and then I could simply put that into something like ChatGPT, for example. So let me go ahead and do that. Let me bring up ChatGPT. I'm going to have to grab it from my other window here and drag this on over. So here it comes. All right. So we're going to grab ChatGPT. And um, again, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what, let me let me select that text. I know I'm on, on another screen here. I'm doing it off, off to the side here, but I'm selecting the text uh, um, and I'm going to copy and paste that right into here. And we could use 3.5 or 4. It, this is going to work fine in either one of these, uh, but I'll go ahead and paste it in. You'll notice it's that full text. So there's all of that transcript there. But then I did throw one thing at the top. That's what I was copying. Um, uh, I said, generate a summary for the following YouTube transcript of the, of the video, what are glaciers, crash course geography number 26. And then there is the actual transcript. So basically I'm just gonna take this, paste it right into here. And again, you could use 3.5 or four, either way is fine. Go ahead and throw that in there. Four is probably gonna take a little bit longer. It does think a little bit more <laughs> when it's when it's uh, doing the work. 3.5 is a little bit quicker on that, but no worries. Here it comes up. We're getting a, a nice summarization of the video. So if we needed to provide the summary to the students and say, okay, you're gonna watch this video. Here's the main points. Here's the gist of this. And of course we could have it rewrite this at different Lexile levels and so forth if we want to simplify it up even more than that. Now, at the same time, maybe what I'm wanting to do, though, is maybe I'm wanting to make a study guide, you know, that I want the students to be answering questions while they're watching the video. So we could go further and say something like generate five BOK level one questions and answers based on the transcript. And now it's going to run through and do that. You know, what are glaciers and what are the two main types of glaciers? And you get the idea. Now we could do the same for DOK level two and three and four and so on. Uh, the nice thing about this, though, is it's it's such an easy way to be able to grab that transcript nice and quick. Now, you can most of the time get the transcript right from YouTube as well. It's not always formatted as cleanly as this. And so I do like the way that this site just makes it simple. Drop the link in. Boom. You've got the transcript. Easy to copy and easy to use. So anyway, um, that was one of the first ones that I wanted to mention here uh, tonight. Um, again, if you've got questions or comments on any of these, please do throw those in the chat. Uh, happy to uh, take those. I'll try to pause in between each one and see if there's uh, questions popping in there. Uh, do see uh, Peggy saying how that will save a lot of time. I absolutely agree. Um, oh, and Jerry said, thanks for sharing and wanted to know if we could watch this again later. Absolutely. Um, so um, this is uh, broadcasting live right now, but it is uh, being recorded as well. And so uh, the exact same link that you're watching it at now, you can watch it again afterwards. The recording will be there and I always post it on my website as well. And hey, Anna has said hi as well. Uh, nice to have you here with us tonight, Anna. Thanks. All right. Well, let's keep on moving because we got lots of cool stuff to look at. So let's take a look at um, the second uh, EdTech link of the week, which is called Number High. Okay, so what is Number High? So this one, I've seen it a couple of times recently. It's been popping up on some different feeds and some different websites. I'm like, I, I think I need to take a look at this. And so what this is, is a totally free math game. So there's no cost whatsoever to this, totally free, that allows students to practice multiplication tables up to 12 times 12. So if you've got students where they're trying to work on multiplication, this is great. Uh, basically, you can play this on a computer. You can play it on a phone. So it's, it works on Android, iOS, or the web. And the way it works is basically you're picking two numbers. Well, you're picking one of two numbers to form a multiplication problem and claim a cell on the grid. And you try to get four cells in a row to win. You can... Uh, play against a real person, an opponent, or you can play against AI. Now, I'm going to demonstrate it tonight. I'll just play against the AI so you can uh, see how it works. But uh, let's go ahead and pop this open, and we'll take it for a quick spin here. So I'm going to head over to the Number Hive website. And again, like I said, you can get it on Google Play or the, the Apple App Store. I'm just going to choose the uh, PC or Mac option up here at the top so I can play it right here on the computer. Um, and then here, of course, um, 
I'm just going to do the practice option where you can play against an AI, but you could play online, online, you could host your own game, you could join a game. And so you can play with other people. But for this example right now, I'm just going to say that I'm going to practice, which allows me to play against an AI. So this is just AI mode. And I'm going to do an easy one. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it really simple and easy here. Uh, but this will show you the idea because anytime I do something live, you never know <laughs> what's going to go wrong. So I'm going to keep it simple on myself. So really, well, basically, here's the idea. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get four in a row. And of course, you can do that in many different directions here on a uh, hive type of a, of, of a layout. Now, the way it works is there's always two numbers that are being multiplied. It starts out with one times one. Now, your job is on your turn, you can only change one of these two numbers. So basically, I've got to leave one of them as one, but I could change either of them up to you know two through 12. And when I do that, it'll then multiply those two together and it will claim that cell. So on my first move, all I'm gonna be able to do is a one through a 12 because it's one times one through 12. So I could play on this one or this nine or this four, or this eight or this three or this seven or six. So really what I, what I normally do is just try to look around and say, okay, well, I know I've got to start with one through 12. So is there a good place on the board? So I don't know, maybe this seven up here, you know, kind of in the middle, maybe I can work off of that pretty well. So I might say, okay, one times seven. So I claim that one. Now the AI is going, and it had to leave either the one or the seven alone, and it had to pick one number to change. Well, it changed the seven to a 10, so it went there. So now I've got a one and a 10 that I'm working from. And so I, I probably would think, okay, well, that 10 would be great because I could do a 10 and a five or a 10 and a nine if I'm trying to build off of this one here. So I, I don't know. Sure, let's do the 10 and the nine, you know. And again, this is going to keep going back and forth as we are claiming these. Oh, great. <laughs> so now, oh, this isn't too bad. I could do the nine and the two. Maybe it's, oh, I could branch off a different direction here. So I could do like the nine and the two. So I've got two different options to maybe make four in a row here. And again, if, if I don't get through this quickly, um, that, well, hey, actually, I think I'm in pretty good shape here. I do see I've got an 11, so I could do 11 and a one. So I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. Uh, I just need to be able to get, oh, and I think I can do it. Yes, there's a two and I could do a 10 to get this 20 up here. Yay, I did not completely embarrass myself while doing this live. <laughs> so there you go. And so what a fun way to really work on your multiplication tables in this really neat fun game that's completely free and easy to play on any device. So wanted to uh, get that one out on folks' radar. I think this is a pretty schnazzy tool. Again, that is number high. So do check that out and share that out with your math friends or just enjoy playing it yourself as well. Hey, we got another hello from Kristen. Hi, Kristen. Thank you so much for being here. Great to see you. All right, let's keep on going. So what is up next? G E teach. Okay, so what is this? So GE teach is a interactive map tool. And what it does is it lets you view two maps side by side for anywhere on the earth. And what you get to do is you get to choose from dozens of layers for each map to compare, contrast, and to look for connections between them. So you're going to be looking at the same place on Earth. You can zoom in wherever you want. It's going to be the same spot on both sides, but you can change what the map is representing, and then you can look for you know comparisons between those. So let's try this out. Let's go to the GE Teach website. Give that a moment to pop up there. Um, and so the way you navigate here is, you, of course, you can you know, zoom in and zoom out just with your scroll wheel. At least that's how I tend to do it. I guess there's the little plus and minus down there as well. But in addition to that, you're going to notice that at the bottom, there's this button that says select map. And when you click that, that's going to let you choose what map you want to show. And you can do this for map one and for map two. So for example, let's say for map one, I'm going to do something physical. Maybe I'll choose, um, let's see, let's do physical and let's do uh, physical maps. And maybe now I'll narrow it down to the uh, NOAA physical map. There we go. Now, so what you'll notice is you pick a map. And then after you pick a map, then you pick a layer inside of the map. Some of these maps only have one layer. Some have 
bunches of layers inside of them. So now what do I have so far? So at the moment, what I've got here is I've got this map set to the NOAA physical. Well, now I want to decide what should this map be? So same thing again, come over here and select a map. Maybe this time I'll go to human geography and I'll pick something out of there. So maybe I want to go with population density. Now, if population density, it doesn't have multiple layers, so that's fine. It's just what it is. So basically now I'm comparing population density with the the uh, the physical geography. And of course, right away, we can start to see some things like, okay, notice these areas <laughs> that don't have a lot of density. Well, there's mountains there, you know? And so it's, that's a pretty, or like here, we've got a desert coming across here. And so the population density is a lot lower. Uh, uh, or we can look at areas that are much colder and we can see the same thing there. So that's a pretty easy one to see that connection. But we could try other things like, Maybe we'll come back here and we'll select another map. We'll go to human geography. Let's go to economics. And maybe we'll do uh, the poverty uh, rate, the percentage of the population that are in poverty. And then we could pop over to map number two. And on map number two, uh, we'll see how, how does poverty, how is it connected to, let's say, life expectancy? So we could jump into demographics. And then from demographics, we could choose life expectancy. Now, again, you know, it's up to us now to start investigating. Do we notice a connection? Probably pretty close on this. We can see areas of higher uh, poverty here in a darker red. And we compare that with a life expectancy. We are seeing, in general, a lower life expectancy in those areas. And again, those are just two quick examples. There are so many maps here. Uh, you can go through the physical maps, the, the human maps, and then inside of each one of those, there's so many uh, subsets of layers within them. So a really neat way to do a nice side-by-side -side comparison. I think the real learning though is going to come in asking, what do you see? You know, so, so what, you know, and asking the students to draw conclusions and make predictions. That's where the real learning is going to occur. Good stuff. All right. Um, Ryan had a question. How up to date is the information? Well, Ryan, um, that's a good question. And I think a lot of the times it is uh, listed on here. Like if I go into the layers, mm, which ones was it? I know there were some that actually, great question, Ryan. I really appreciate that. There were some in here. Let me just click through a few. I thought there were some that had the date actually listed. There we go. Well, okay. So I did remember seeing a few that had the dates men, you know, listed. So like these were showing from different, you know, different years and time, uh, the earth at night, uh, let me see. Um, here we've got said the human development index. You can see you can compare different years from 1980 up to 2021. So I guess not all of them have have listed what the dates are of them. Uh, but if I click through these, it does look like um, a couple of them listed that. Now, the question is, how up to date is all the information? Otherwise, good question. I'm not positive. I would say that would probably be a good thing for us to go into our information here and see. Uh, there's a little, there's a little I button here. Hopefully, this will give a little bit more information on some of these. And I, I'm not totally sure of what on each one of these. Some of them. Um, yep, it does look like it is at least listing where that came from. So I would say, please do. Yeah. Click on the little I button and investigate for each one of these if you are curious about uh, more details on where that specific data came from and uh, hopefully how, how recent or up-to-date it is. Good question. And very good to see you recently, Ryan. Ryan was just at the uh, uh, the uh, ITIP Ohio Google Summit Conference. We had a wonderful time together. Really great getting a chance to catch up. I learned a lot from Ryan. <laughs> a lot of things I share on this come from his newsletter as well. So uh, always a big thank you to Ryan for what he shares with all of us. All right, let's keep on moving. What is up next? So next up, we're going to talk about DraftBack. Now, this is not a new tool. DraftBack has been around for a long time. The thing is, I've been talking about it a lot more recently because of the rise of AI. Um, we've had a lot of discussions where people are saying, okay, uh, I, how do I know? How do I know if uh, my student actually wrote this essay that they're turning in? Well, um, there's lots of tools out there, but ones we definitely don't want to forget about are the ones that we've been using for years, such as the version history tool that is built right into Google Docs. Well, DraftBack builds off 
um, off of that. It is a totally free extension that you can install in Google Chrome and then use to actually watch the version history, to see the document getting typed, to see whether or not the student really did type it up or whether it was copied and pasted from somewhere else. So what I'm going to do, let me turn it on. I've got it turned off at the moment. So I'm going to come up to my extensity tool. And I'm going to turn draft back, back on. There it is. Okay. So I've got it turned on. And then I'm going to pull open two different Google documents here. I know you can't see them at the moment. Give me just a moment. I'll drag them over onto the screen here. All right. So here comes one of them. And then here comes the other one. All right, there we go. All right, so I've got these two essays, and they're, they're the same essay. They're both just a pretend essay about George Washington. But one of these, I actually typed up, like line by line. I, mean, I was copying it from something else, but you know, I, uh, but I, I typed it up line by line to illustrate what it should look like when somebody is actually typing up a paper versus the other one I just copied and pasted. So Basically, under normal conditions, what you would do is you would go to your file menu, you would go to version history and say, I want to see the version history of this document. Well, in this first example here, you'll see it's a pretty telling situation. At first, at 4.02 p.m., there is no information. And at 4.05 p.m., boom, everything's there. It just all shows up all at once. So clearly that was copied and pasted. Whereas in this other one, if I go into file and I go into version history and I see that it's a much more uh, expensive expected uh, type of a layout where there's nothing and then suddenly there's a couple of things and then there's another sentence and then there's a bit of an outline and then there's another sentence and another sentence and another sentence. So we can see bit by bit by bit that is being written and that's what we'd expect to see. Well, that's great. Well, what we can do is if you have DraftBack installed, which again, DraftBack link is here that will take you out to the Chrome Web Store where you can install DraftBack. So once you've got draft back installed, now notice when I look in the top corner, there's a draft back button for each one of these. And so, for example, this one here, if I click on the draft back button, I can play the version history. And so it's actually showing me what it was like when the student was literally typing this up. Now you can in increase the, uh, the the speed uh, here, make that go a little bit faster <laughs> so you can see it a little bit better. Um, and so that's nice to be able to actually see it getting typed up. But what I like even more is I like the link up here that says document graphs and statistics, because this is just a really easy look at, OK, when did the student work on this? And I can see, you know, this day they did. And then a couple of days later, they worked on it again and they worked on a different, you know, you know, throughout throughout the evening there, they're working on it. And I can see all of the revisions that were being made to it. So that tells a much better story. And I absolutely want to encourage people to use tools like this more than some of those AI checkers, because listen, maybe they're going to figure it out at some point, but right now there's a there's a lot of inaccuracy in those, uh, those AI checkers. And I'm sure you've played with them. There's some better than others, but the point is they're, they're not hundred percent accurate. Sometimes not very accurate at all as the AI continues to get better. Um, and so a tool like this though, to say, listen, okay, when you write your essay, I need you to write it in docs. You've got Google Docs and you need you to write it in that It's so that you're covered and I'm covered. So when I look at this heads up, if I come across something that seems odd, I'm going to look at your version history. And, and, I, and so a tool like DraftBack is just an easy way to be able to view that quickly and easily. So. And in, in, in anyway, just wanted to bring that one back up. Again, it is not new. <laughs> this one has been around for a long time. It's been a favorite for a long time, but I think it's more relevant now than it's been for quite a while. So I wanted to get that back on everybody's uh, radar. All right, good stuff. Let's keep going. Again, a couple extra this week. Normally, I only have about three, but it's been three weeks. <laughs> so I threw a few extra ones in here. Um, so next up, we have Toucan. Let's talk about Toucan. So this is uh, an extension that I started playing around with recently because I was uh, doing a session on my favorite extensions. And so this is one of them that was in my list. And I played with it a long time ago, but then started diving back into it recently. And was like, wow. This is really nice. So this is a free extension that will uh, help you learn uh, a, a language in a really creative, natural way. So what it does is if you turn Toucan on and you pick the language that you want, 
When you are just reading a regular website, it will automatically translate certain words on that page into the language you're trying to learn. So right in the middle of the article you're reading, there'll be some French words or some Spanish words or whatever language you're trying to, to learn. And so you will then learn that, that word in the context of what you're already reading. And you can play mini games to test your vocabulary and uh, you can... Uh, you know, pick certain words and then, you know, save them to your, to your favorites that you want to come back to later. Um, and of course you can select any word on the page and have it translated, uh, right then and there as well. Well, let me turn to cam on. I've got it turned off at the moment. We'll come back in here to I'll turn off draft back and I'll turn to can back on. There we go. And so now that I've got two can turned on, uh, let me pull up Dogo News. That's my go-to. I always pull up Dogo News, current event article website for kids. So this will be this will be fine. We'll go ahead and pull this one up here, um, and maybe we'll jump. We'll read this article about a meteorite crash. Okay, excellent. Now, once I have Toucan loaded, if I come up and give a click on Toucan up here, what you're going to notice is in my settings, I've chosen French for this example, and I've chosen beginner. <laughs> but of course, you can choose different uh, levels here. You can control lots of things as to you know when it pops up and so forth. But so what should be happening here is if I start scrolling down through this article, there should just be random French words in here. And there are. So there we go. So I'm noticing these words that are uh, highlighted are in French. And so the idea is I could be reading along and be like, okay, um, when Susie Cop entered her father's chambre. Okay, well, what is that? Well, if I hover above it, oh, bedroom. Okay, and I can have it, you know, speak the word. Chambre. And then if I want to, I can practice it as well. I can come down here and click on practice. And in this case, I would, I would say the word, you know, uh, in this case, it looks like they want me to say it three times. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe I, I'm not able to do that right now. And so uh, I, I could do, I could practice another way. Chambre means what? Well, bedroom, you know. And so, and again, I can keep practicing this over and over until I've mastered it. I can come click up here if I want to say, yep, I've got this one mastered, or I can add it to my list of words that I'm working on as well. I just think this is really neat because it's just very natural. I, I'm reading along and just peppered throughout the things I'm reading. I'm going to be getting that other language right there in the stuff that I'm working on. So that's a, that, that's a neat way to, because you may forget sometimes, okay, like, oh, I really should, you know, practice, you know, what the language I'm working on. Well, if this is turned on, you're basically practicing it all the time. It's just part of what you're doing. So anyway, thought that was a really neat one to mention. I will go ahead and turn it off just because uh, since I'm not using it right at the moment, I don't want it uh, popping back up <laughs> on everything else as we go through. But uh, definitely wanted to give a shout out to Toucan. All right, and that brings us to the last around the web before we hit some of the things from uh, from my uh, blog. And the last thing we're going to talk about are some Google Arts and Culture AI experiments. So a lot of AI stuff as usual. Um, this one uh, was a combination of two of my favorite things: Google Arts and Culture, which I absolutely love, uh, and then also um, AI, which we all uh, love as well. Uh, so basically, Google Arts and Culture is a wonderful website. They've got so many fantastic things there, um, and uh, they've put out recently some AI experiments. Um, I'm going to pop that website open so we can take a look at this blog post they did on it, and they they put out four different experiments. Now, I'm just going to demonstrate one of them that I think is a, a pretty clever uh, game that we can use that ties nicely into AI. But there's four different ones here. The one I'm going to highlight is called Odd One Out. Um, so this is a game where you're going to be shown four images. Three of them are from Google Arts and Culture. Now, if you're not familiar with Google Arts and Culture, again, it's where Google has scanned in like every painting, every sculpture, every work of art that ever existed. And so you can learn all about all this amazing art. Well, what they're doing in this game is they're going to show you three images that are from Google Arts and Culture and then one image that is AI generated. And you're goal is to guess the imposter. Can you figure out which one's AI generated? Well, I think that's pretty cool. That's that at least that's a good discussion to bring up and say, okay, 
can we tell? Is it, you know, how can we tell if something is AI generated? And how good are we at doing that? So let's go ahead and we'll pull up and play. And I think I will do terrible. <laughs> I, I have not been very successful on this one, but we'll we'll try it. So basically what's going to happen is we got four tries. Um, if we're wrong four times, the game is over. So you see how far you can get. And there's a timer as well. Okay, so here we go. They're going to give us uh, the topic and show us it's a teapot. So which one of these do I think is AI generated? I think maybe this one is AI generated. Oh, no, it was wrong. Okay. Maybe it's this one. No, oh, no. This one. Oh, my goodness. I was the one over here. Oh, I, I already lost. <laughs> I, I did pretty bad. Uh, so I could replay there and try that again. So which is the AI generated blade? Okay. Well, now I'm doubting myself on everything. Maybe this one? Almost. No. Okay. Maybe this one? Oh, woo, I got it. <laughs> if nothing else, I don't think I'm going to do well in this game, but I think that's kind of the point of it to show us, you know, how realistic uh, AI generated images are. So could be a neat one to open up a discussion when you're talking about evaluating information that you find online as well. All right. Good stuff. Well, that brings us to the end of our Around the Web resources. Um, we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about some things that I have shared recently on my blog. All right. So let's go ahead and run through these uh, quickly. Uh, two of these are webinars that I've done recently um, that I'm happy to have available for people to take a look at. So the first webinar is one on AI, uh, specifically Google AI and education. And so I got the opportunity to be part of the Week of AI, which was hosted by Teacher Goals. Uh, there's a link there to the whole Week of AI. There was loads of awesome people, 18 people speaking all week long. I was one of the 18. And I, for mine, I did the topic of Google AI in education. Um, so this is about a 45 minute long video. And um, I think, you know, AI is changing so fast <laughs> that right now this is the most up-to-date <laughs> version of this. I will probably be giving this exact same, you know, uh, presentation many, many times uh, over the summer and in the fall. Uh, but at the moment, this is currently the most uh, up-to-date version of it. Um, and what I end up covering is uh, the main content from my uh, Google AI resource document here. Um, so if you do want to look at that document as well, that document shows the main content that I was covering in that session. Mostly what I end up doing in this session is I talk about, um, I jump all the way down to the uh, AI tools that are just rolling out now. So we hit Google Bard, and then we talk about the tools that are coming, the things that Google is rolling out over the next few weeks and months in their Google products. So we, we dive deep into Bard, and we look at what is to come. Then we spend a pretty good chunk of time going through uses, ways that we could use AI in our classes um, and our in teaching and learning. And then we wrap up with uh, some suggestions for addressing AI misuse. So do check that out. Um, uh, that is a uh, again, about a 45 minute long video. Um, and a big thanks to Teacher Goals for letting me be a part of the uh, week of AI. Uh, the other uh, one that I have posted recently is um, the Google Screencast for Teaching and Learning webinar. So about a year ago, Screencast uh, became available. Uh, it was like last summer. And I did at that time a much shorter video, like a 13 minute, you know, introduction to what is Google Screencast. Well, I had meant to do a full uh, video at some point where I could really dive into all the details and also talk a lot about uses. How can we use this tool? How can students use it? How can we use it? And so that is what this is. This is a 41 minute webinar that was recorded and uh, it covers uh, loads of stuff about screencast, like, you know, how to use it. So there's a, a good chunk of it is, you know, all the buttons to click and how to use it and how it works and, you know, how to record and annotate and edit and share and all of that. But then there's a big chunk of the video as well where I talk just about how we can use it. So I run through a bunch of examples uh, in the second half of the video where we try out all these different examples here on how we could use a tool like this as a teacher or as students. And again, I do have a resource document with this one as well. Um, uh, try to provide these for each of the sessions. And so this one also has a resource document that you can uh, click on all the links throughout the session as well. 
All right. So those are two recent webinars that uh, I, there's, there, there, there's more to come, but those are the ones I've been able to get uh, put on my site recently. And then lastly, uh, we are getting close to the ISTE conference that's coming up at the uh, end of June. And I've had a bunch of updates and I think there's a couple more still coming, but I wanted to uh, let folks know if you are attending ISTE, um, there's some uh, some things I wanted to get on your radar there. So this uh, lists all of the sessions I'll be doing in ISTE. As you can see, it's a pretty busy time. I've got something going on every day, uh, some days, multiple things uh, happening. But there's a, there were two things for sure that I wanted to get on your radar that were uh, a little bit newer. And they're both just sort of fun things. And so I'm going to scroll on down to uh, Tuesday evening. Um, I'm uh, helping out with the, the Vivacity Tech uh, and HP party. So this is one of those after, you know, after events. Uh, this one goes from 7 to 11.30 on, on uh, this, this one is on uh, Monday. Sorry, th this one's on Monday night. Make sure I'm telling the right day here. So yes, this one is on I have so many things going on there. He said, yes, this is Monday. So this is Monday night. So on Monday night uh, from uh, 7 to 1130 is going to be um, the Vivacity Tech and HP party at the City Winery of Philadelphia. Uh, it's free, just like many of these events are. There's a link here to register for that. Uh, we're going to have lots of great stuff. Lots of you know food and drinks and fun, raffles and prizes and so forth. And uh, I will be at that one and excited to get to be a part of that. So uh, hopefully you can pop in and stop by uh, for part of that. And then uh, that's Monday night. And then Tuesday night, the thing that I wanted to mention is something that we're still organizing, but we're putting together an, an ISTE board game meetup. And so several of us love playing board games in our regular life. And we enjoy when we go to a conference to try to get together with folks as well. So we're planning for Tuesday evening to have a board game meetup. We'll provide lots of board games. We'll encourage people to bring their own as well planning on probably having some food and drinks and stuff as well. Maybe have people chip in a little bit to help with that. We'll figure all that out. So we're still nailing down the specifics. What we're asking right now is if this sounds interesting to folks, we have an, a quick, simple interest form. If you don't mind filling that out, it's basically just, you know, hey, who are you? Are you interested in attending this? Could you bring some games? <laughs> Would you like some food? <laughs> you know, any comments or, you know, questions? And then that's going to let us be able to keep you in the loop so that as we do get this nailed down, We'll have an idea of how many people may be interested and we can let you know exactly when and where we will be doing that. So a lot of neat things going on there. Just wanted to get all those back on everybody's radar. All right, so we're going to pause there. I know I've been rambling for quite a bit there. I'm going to take a quick look at our chat and, and remind you, this is still a great time. If you have questions, comments, please th throw them in the chat before uh, before we start to wrap up here. Uh, taking a quick look down through the list. Um, let's see. Ryan said that he's very excited about Screencast. Yes, Screencast is great, especially some of the updates that are coming to it. Um, initially, Screencast, you had to have a Chromebook to be able to watch the recordings, which really limited your ability to share them out with other people. That is uh, is changing. Google is um, going to be rolling out soon a web player for them. So even though you'll need a Chromebook to record the screencasts, you'll be able to play them on any device. And so that's going to really make it a lot easier to share that uh, your videos out uh, broadly from that. So that's awesome. Um, Let's see. Uh, Peggy said, is there any possibility there'll be recordings from your ISTE sessions if you can't attend live? I don't I don't know. I, I, I do believe a few of my sessions are being recorded because I remember getting those uh, messages from the ISTE program committee saying, hey, heads up, the room you're going to be in is one of the rooms that's being recorded. But I don't believe they're like publicly accessible. Like, I mean, uh, if, if you have if you've paid for um, the ISTE conference, even as a virtual uh, attendee, then yes, you would have access to those. But I, I don't believe that they would be available beyond that. Having said that, um, I, I am going to continue to try to, I've got more webinars that I've done and will be doing that. I will continue to try to get those uh, put onto my blog over time, uh, just the versions that I make of those as well. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, so much for joining us here tonight. A little bit of wrap up as we start to pull all this together. As a reminder, you can always get to this document at bit.ly slash CAA live. And please connect with me in whatever way works best for you. 
big thing is you probably notice I don't at the moment have another date on here yet for the next live just because I'm heading right back into a bunch of trainings. I've got a lot of them coming up here. So it's a little bit of a, uh, that's kind of summer for you. So uh, what I would suggest is stay in the loop um, a couple of ways. Um, I would encourage you to subscribe to the Control Alt Achieve Google Calendar. That way, when I do <laughs> figure out when the next date is, I'll be able to do a live one. It'll just pop up on your calendar. I would also encourage you to um, join the Control Alt Achieve email discussion group or sign up for my newsletter. All of those will let you know. You'll always know from there, oh, hey, Eric's got another one of these live ones coming up. It's really possible that the summer is going to be kind of hit and miss, but that's understandable. So uh, be aware, probably going to be a little bit light on the live sessions over the summer, but for sure, when we get back to uh, August and get back to the school year, we'll get back uh, going on a more regular basis. So for now, I want to say thank you so much for joining me here tonight. Please do stay connected so that uh, as I do post the next one, you'll know of that and also just all the things that I, I intend on sharing over the summer. And uh, I love being connected to you guys because it's a great way for me to learn as well. Well, with all of that said, again, thank you everybody so very much for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and I look forward to learning with you again soon. Take care, everybody.